Um, thank you all for coming today to our uh, luncheon with the Governor Sununu, and uh, I would like to take a moment to first thank our sponsors of this event. Our presenting sponsors are Casella Waste Management. Thank you very much, Casella, for being part of this. And also Bar Harbor Bank and Trust and the Visiting Nurses Association and Hospice of Vermont and New Hampshire. At this time, I'd like to introduce the board chair of the Hanover Area Chamber of Commerce, Jennifer Packard, who's gonna say a few words. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. And by the way, the governor is 6'1", in case anybody needs to know his height. He did inform me of that. So I'd like to welcome everyone today to our State of the State Luncheon with our special guest, Governor Chris Sununu. Before we get started, I would like to thank our presenting sponsor again, as Tracy did, Casella Way Systems, as well as Bell Bar Harbor Bank and Trust, Dartmouth College, the Visiting Nurse Alliance and Hospice for Vermont and New Hampshire for partnering with us today to put this presentation together. The Hanover and Lebanon Chambers of Commerce have had a tradition going back for over, well over 25 years, perhaps even longer, for inviting the governor in the off election year to address the Upper Valley business community and to give us an overall update on the state of our state. As many of you know, our two chambers have collaborated on many programs over our long histories. And recently, our two organizations have decided that we might be stronger and more effective as a unified organization. So when we invite the governor to return in two years, our tradition of hosting this event will be as a unified chamber under the name, and you will recognize, hopefully you'll see this a lot, the Upper Valley Business Alliance. The Upper Valley economy continues to thrive and grow, but we do face two key limiting factors, the high cost and lack of affordable housing and very shallow labor pool, which I'm sure we all, in some realm or another, have suffered through. Many of our local companies, such as Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Dartmouth College, are building expansions, but we have numerous positions that cannot be filled. And the most often cited reason is that those willing to relocate to our area face sticker shock at the cost of housing or having trouble finding available housing at all. This problem is not new, unique to the Upper Valley, but it affects all of New Hampshire, as I'm sure Governor Sununu will discuss. Governor Chris Sununu first took office of the governor in January 2017 and won election, re-election, starting his second term in January of this year. He served as a member of the Executive Council for seven years prior to winning the governor's seat. Before entering public service, he was a business owner serving as a CEO of Waterville Valley Resort and as a civil and environmental engineer by trade, holding a BS in engineering from NIT. It is my pleasure to introduce the six foot one honorable Governor Chris Sununu. Wow. Thank you. Wait, put that, no? Wrong one? This is like a trick. Okay, I'm going to put that one down. Do you mind if I put that down? Well, afternoon. Good to see you. Wow, I feel like I'm a little far away. How about I do this? Is that all right? Great. Well, uh, thank you guys. Thank you very much for having us up here. Um, always good to come up. I was over at Nova Nordic uh, this morning. We got to sit down with Casella a little bit. We've been traveling to the state a lot. Now that we've got, uh, got the budget done, it kind of freezes up a little bit. We've been the schedule. Really get out and just um, do a little bit of this where, again, I don't want to talk too much. I just, uh, one, one thing we, I will do is kind of give a little bit of the state of the state. I'll tend to go a little bit fast, so if you can bear with me on that. And then we'll open it up for questions if, if folks like. So we always like to kind of get the feedback. I mean, I, I'm a big believer that in a place like New Hampshire, very, very unique in that there's access, right? Not just to the governor. Uh, we have Michael Crines here. Um, Executive Council Mark, uh, Councilor Crines is here as well. Um, and the fact that your state senators can be here or the representatives, whoever it might be, there's real access to a lot of the decision makers. The fact that we have local control and your towns have kind of so much say in terms of what's going to happen to your business, which, yeah, pro and con, right? It can be, um, it, 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 those can be tough battles, as a, as a lot of you know, but they're usually battles with your friends and people that you know. And you can go and argue for whether it's how a, a certain dollars should be spent or what you want to see in your schools or the permitting and zoning that you'd like to see. Um, so we have a very unique system that provides a lot of opportunity and really empowers the individual. And compared to other states, there's, there's literally nothing like it, like not even close. Um, and so 
there's a, a huge asset in that. But let me, let me back up a little bit and kind of talk at 30,000 feet. So uh, let's first start with the economy. Um, economy's awesome. I mean, we are really rocking and rolling here. Um, the fact that, uh, again, I don't always buy into all the rankings, but we have some really good rankings out there. I mean, we were just ranked the number one state for private business northeast of Ohio to come into. We're now ranked the number one state in the northeast for millennials to move into, right? And, and again, that's not by accident, that's really by design. We've really designed a system, especially in 2017 and 2018, we really designed a system that said, okay, we're going to streamline a lot of the regulatory nonsense that has gotten in people's way. And, and I mean, in, in one fell swoop, we took um, something like 1,600 regulations right off the books because they were antiquated. They really didn't make sense. They were just getting in folks' way and in a very easy way with no real discussion. We were able to take it off the books and start streamlining some of those processes. That's very important. Um, look, I, it's no secret, I'm very pro-business. I believe very strongly in business because I'm a huge believer that when you become the strongest pro-business state around, you start attracting businesses in, uh, you create all this opportunity, economic opportunity that flows down to the individual, it flows down to families, creates a better quality of life and, 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 and so on. Now it doesn't mean we don't have other issues we have to deal with, mental health, opioids, child protection. I mean when I came into office those three things were absolute disasters. I mean, that is unquestionable, not even debatable. Absolute disasters. And we're finally able, again, to reinvest some of our resources at the state, focus on what are going to be priorities, challenge ourselves to, to take on things there no, that there might not be easy answers to. Look, I'm one of the only governors in the country that has to get elected every two years. Me and our, my buddy Phil Scott, right, in Vermont. Every other governor gets a four-year term. Now, there are pros and cons to that. I mean, the con is, look, I love the accountability. People have all the say in the world, and elected officials have to be accountable. The downside is you gotta run every two years, and I'm not gonna lie, campaigns stink. <laughs> They're terrible. I hate campaigning. Um, I, I'm a manager, and I like to manage. Um, but the, the process itself allows, again, for this to happen, and allows things to, to, to really move forward. Now, it'd be very easy to say, well, mental health, we're just gonna throw some money over there, and we're not really gonna deal with it. And to be very frank about it, for 12, 14 years, that's exactly what was happening. And we were being sued time and time again by the mental health community. And when I came in, I, I, it's, I'm an engineer. I, I've tried to read lawsuits. I don't do so well with, I mean, it's hard. Anyone ever read like a full lawsuit? My goodness. I've read one cover to cover, and it was the mental health lawsuit. And it was one of the first things I did when I became governor. And I read it, I had to read, it was a long weekend. I had to read it a couple times, I'm not gonna lie. But I got it, and I said, oh wait, they're right. We should be sued, this is a disaster. And so and my strategy was instead of, bringing, instead of bringing just a bunch of bureaucrats and elected officials into what are we going to do, we said, okay, we'll bring some of them in, but we're really gonna bring in individuals, and we're gonna bring stakeholders, and we're gonna talk to the community, and we're gonna let them design the new 10-year mental health plan. And we have a new plan, and it was written by private citizens. It was written by families and moms and their input. And then it has real action items in it. And the 10-year mental health plan, my goodness, we got about 70% of it done in year one, which is great. Now, we still have a long way to go, but we're starting to turn that around. Same thing with opioids, child welfare, complete disaster, right? I fired a, a bunch of the top folks. I said, you're not cutting it. We're not going to keep doing, going down the same path. You're gone. I'm bringing in a better team. So my point in all this is you've got to be, be willing to kind of challenge yourself and take on some of, the, some of the tough issues. Now, it doesn't mean we do everything perfect here. It doesn't mean that some of these initiatives we started are 100% where, where we need to go. I'm an engineer, and one thing I learned uh, early on uh, in my career, a little bit at MIT, was um, you have to design a system knowing that you're, you're not gonna design it the right way the first time, right? You have to design flexibility. And if there's anything the government is not, is flexible, right? Almost by design. Government tends to be stuck in silos and not very flexible. And the laws are written very rigid. And you've got to stay in that lane. But this is the 21st century. And if we don't understand that child welfare here and opioids and mental health, all these issues that we're dealing with, they're all connected in one way or another. The left hand has to know what the right hand is doing. And so we're trying to integrate in a, a whole, a whole different new way these models of thinking. And we're, we're having a lot of success. And it isn't because the governor's doing it, it isn't because just the legislature's doing it, or the Republicans, or the Democrats, we're all doing it. And we're being very successful at that. Now we just got through the budget, 
Um, the budget is really kind of the key document of the state, if you will. It kind of sets the tone, the priorities, uh, where we're going to go as a state. It's a very, very important. So it's important you get it right. We do it every two years. <clears throat> and as I think everybody knows, I vetoed the, the budget they gave me in June. It was really simple. I said, as the chief executive, my job is to make sure the math works, right? You got to make sure it's balanced. You got to make sure we can pay the bills at the end of the day. You got to make sure we're not abusing, you know, the taxpayers who are helping fund it. And I kept reminding the folks in Concord, this is not our money. It is your money, right? It is your money. And so we have a huge responsibility to that. When you have a $200 million surplus, I said, how do we, how, how do you expect me to go out and tell businesses I'm going to raise their taxes when I have $200 million more than I ever thought I would have? Like that just doesn't make sense. And their budget, again, they spend about $100 million of one-time money on long-term programs. Well, that money's not going to be there, right? We kind of have this spike in revenue, right? I'm not here pushing for Trump or anything, but the Trump tax cuts, I mean, they worked, I mean, really, really well to the tune of having this huge in influx of cash. But it's, we know it's not going to last. They're kind of a short-term thing. So when you have this revenue bump, you don't plan on it still going up and skyrocketing. You got, that's one-time money. And that's what you're seeing with, this, with, the, with the budget, that we, that the compromise. Why we're sending so much back to cities and towns for infrastructure, for revenue sharing, for infrastructure in schools. This is one-time money we have. And again, it, it isn't that the state should be spending all that extra money. You should be spending it. The cities and the towns and the taxpayers, the property taxpayers, you have to reap that benefit. And that was fundamentally one of the larger battles that we had. How, they, how the, the other side, uh, the Democrats really wanted to spend the money, I gave them a lot of flexibility in that. Um, but I had to make sure the math works. And so we got that structural deficit of about 100 million down to something manageable. It's about 20 million or so, 25 million. I can manage that out of a $13 billion budget. We can, we can handle that um, without seeing any uh, long-term detrimental effects to our programs. And we can move forward. That's it. That's the entire budget, budget battle right there. Now, the battle really happened because it all didn't, nothing really came together, to be honest. We didn't see any real movement on things until the Friday and the Monday before the vote was supposed to be taken on Wednesday. And so it was kind of a wait, 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 hurry up. Um, but we got it done. We got it done. And it isn't Republican. It isn't Democrat. It's New Hampshire. And I really believe that. Um, it's something that really puts the individuals first. It's very easy to say, we're going to believe in a big system and tax more money and create more government and all that. That's a very easy thing to do. There's nothing innovative about that. Right? There's no challenge there. Any politician can get up and say, well, give me more taxes and I'll create more programs and everything will be fine. No. You've got to challenge these systems. If you keep just putting money in the same programs the same way and say, well, we just need more money, well, okay, but you're just pushing harder in the same direction. Sometimes you have to have the courage to say, we're going to go in a different direction. I mean, when I came into office, the opioid crisis had about, we'd put about three, three and a half million dollars into, into drug prevention and treatment programs in the state. Three and a half million a year for the entire state. Shameful, disaster. So when I came in, I said, okay. And there was always a, a debate. How much will the legislature give us? How much, and it was a fight. They spent 80% of the time fighting over how much money they were going to get. And I said, guys, we gotta focus on outcomes. And whether you're talking about opioids and mental health, economic development, what is the product? What do you want to get out of this? And so I said, I have a better idea. It was one of my in the shower moments. I always have my good ideas in the shower. That, that's actually true. Um, so I brought the hospitals together. I said, you're at the front lines of this thing. They're walking into your emergency rooms. You're going to help us make the investment to get this thing off the ground. And through, they all got together and they agreed to give a charitable donation every year, not for three or four or five, but for 10 and a half, 11 million dollars for the next five years guaranteed. So we tripled the amount of money we're doing at the state level, took it out of, off the taxpayer and said, all right, now let's focus on income, uh, on outcomes, right? We got that revenue thing taken care of. Now can we focus on doing a better job? And then we had the whole thing where I went down and I begged and pleaded with the, the president and the administration and I laid out a plan, I said, um, it's, a, it's a long, someday, uh, I'd say read the book someday for the whole story, but I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm not a good writer, but the, the, the short story is this, I went down and I said, okay, here's my plan, I'm going to ask the president, we used to put three million in this program, I'm going to ask the president for a hundred million dollars, and I knew he wasn't going to give us a hundred million, 
but that's, that's like Trump negotiation, right? Ask for something you know you're not going to get and try to get something here. At the end of the day, we got over $50 million, more than a bigger increase than any other state in the country. Not because I went and begged and pleaded for it, because I laid a piece of paper in front of them and I said, this is exactly how we're going to spend it. I'm going to create a whole new system, a whole new infrastructure to not deal with just opioids, but all these other issues. Let me back up a little bit. I, I listen, I, I, I talk a lot about stories. Being able to listen to stories is so important. So, 4th of July, 2017, I tell this one a lot, but it really, it, it resonates through a, a variety of different areas. I'm at a 4th of July parade in Woodsville. Anyone been to the 4th of July parade in Woodsville? It's actually a really good parade. It's great. And that's one of the parades, it's a 4th of July parade that goes from New Hampshire into Vermont. You cross the bridge and go over into Vermont. And after the parade, I'm hanging out, beautiful day, and there's a young woman there, I'm in her mid-20s, 28 maybe, something like that, and she has a couple of young kids, and we're chatting and all that, and she's telling me that she lives in Vermont but works in New Hampshire, she's going to be moving over here, da da da. And um, she says, in, as part of the conversation, I didn't know who she was, she said, as part of the conversation, she said, yeah, you know, I mean, I've been addicted to opioids for like five years, and oh, you know, just dealing with that. And then she went on and said something else, and I went, whoa, 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 what, 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 what are you talking about? She said, yeah, no, I've been struggling, you know, she, uh, it was an injury or something, somehow she had become addicted. But she was just kind of working through it. I said, okay, hold on, we got treatment programs, we got recovery programs, let me help you. And she said, Governor, I appreciate the thought, but what am I going to do, go down to Manchester? drive 150 miles or whatever, and like probably lose my job, get pulled away from my kids. I, thanks, but no thanks. Like She goes, I'll tough it out. I'll tough it out. Three days over that weekend. I'll tough it out. I'll tough it out. I'll tough, it rang in my head, and, I, and it hit me. And I said, that's the real crisis here. It isn't how much money you put into the system. It's the real barrier was rural access to care with opioids, and then it hit me, it's with mental health, it's with child protection. We shouldn't be asking folks in Coas and Grafton and Carroll to hopefully get in their car and maybe come to Concord or Manchester to get the help and services they need. It also made me realize that we had become for decades a state of crisis. And what I, by that I mean, we waited for the crisis to happen before we'd stand up and actually provide a service. We waited for you to become addicted before we said, hey, why don't you come down to Manchester and maybe we'll get you in a 28-day program and send you home. We'll say goodbye and good luck and we all know how that's going to go. Right? So, same with mental health. Child protection, complete disaster. We waited for kids to get the snot kicked out of them before we had the dignity to stand up and say, this isn't right. We can be preventative. That's the fundamental change we've brought across the board. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Rural access to care. You can now go to the hub, and we designed the hub and the doorway, the hub and spoke system, which is working fantastically across the state. And now you can go into your community, get kind of a warm handoff. Here it's in Hanover. Dartmouth manages it locally. Uh, Cheshire Medical manages it down in Cheshire. We have now one in Littleton. We have one in Berlin. And in that place, again, you're not just you know, on the phone with someone. You're there with a professional that'll say, okay, here are the treatment options for you. Now here are the recovery options for you. That one worked, that one didn't. It's always a warm handoff. We're always with you now. We're not asking you to uh, walk in that door and then let us know how it goes. No way. We're, we're doing this recovery-friendly workplace programs. Again, we're getting employers, and if you're not part of it, please ask about it. It's phenomenal. We have up to 50,000 people working in a recovery-friendly workplace. It's something I invented at Waterville Valley. We're going statewide. We come in and train you and your staff what to do, what resources are available if an employee comes to you with a problem. Or how, frankly, not to be afraid to hire someone who's going through recovery. So you know what, what services are in your area, how to deal with it, how to interact with the hub, what to look for, all of it. So that you can and should be a part of the, the, the bigger solution. The global solution happens at a very localized level. All these are new things that we're doing. People didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. They didn't like change. They didn't like us pushing in a new and different direction. But let me tell you, the old way wasn't working. Throwing more money at it was just going to be pushing harder in the wrong direction, and we had to have the courage to move it. Now, why did this all work? Why are we finally able to do all this? Because of the economy. 
because we put business first, because wages are going through the roof, revenues at the state are skyrocketing. We cut taxes and yet have more revenue than we ever thought before. We're planning ahead, we're number one for business, folks are coming in. We had the lowest poverty rate in the country when I became governor, and it's just gotten lower. Unemployment rate down, wages, average, I think our average household wage is now number seven in the country, right? Now we still have some barriers, we're talking about housing. Housing is a huge barrier in this state, very locally controlled. I'd love to get all the zoning and planning boards in my office and scold them. Some towns do it right, some towns don't. Talking to you, Hanover. <laughs> hey, you want business to be here for the long term? Do not rest on your laurels, because let, let me tell you, there are some towns that don't do it right. They're not building housing for the workforce. They're refusing outright to talk about multifamily housing. That is such a problem. So we have a bunch of initiatives that we're going to be putting forward. It isn't an end-all, be-all answer, but we're going to really go after this. Not that the state is going to take control. I don't believe in that. But we're going to create incentives and programs and ways to get some of the local zoning boards, planning boards, incentives for developers, incentives for the towns that, that get on board and create more housing that, again, doesn't just help themselves, but helps the businesses around them and actually allows that pro, all this pro-business stuff that, that's happening to really flourish because it really is one of the biggest barriers out there. So when times are good, that's the time you challenge the system. Don't, if you wait for a crisis to say, well, we have to change the way we do things, as an engineer, I'll tell you, you're only reacting to the crisis, right? When times are good, that's the opportunity that we have to do it a little bit differently. And it isn't doing it just Chris Sununu's way or the legislature's way. We all come together and we make this stuff happen. Sometimes we've got to take a pause. Got to work the checks and balances a little bit. That's okay, right? I mean, the budget's a good example. We all got what we needed to get, and we all had to give up what we wanted a little bit. In the end of the day, it's a really good deal. And yes, we're traveling the state. We're handing out checks all over the state. I'm not going to lie to you. That's fun. It's great to be able to go to Claremont and handle, handle, hand them $6.2 million over and above what they had last year. That's never been done before. Or Manchester, 21 million, so they can handle a variety of issues. And the money comes in all different ways. Some of it's one-time money, where Lou D'Alessandro and I, Lou, anyone know Senator D'Alessandro from Manchester? The Lion of the Senate, the Sage. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a a good Democrat in that, well, I don't mean like there's bad Democrats. I'm not, I don't, <laughs> don't, don't misinterpret me. But he's a really good guy. I've known him forever. And he's tough. He's great. But he's very smart, and he thinks, he thinks deeply about this stuff. And so he said, okay, Governor, we know you want to send money back to towns instead of keeping it in Concord. Well, let's do revenue sharing so every town gets something. Great. Again, however you want to spend it. But uh, what formula do you want to use? We decided to do it on free and reduced lunch so that the towns that have uh, typically a little more of an issue have a higher percentage of free and reduced lunch students. They're going to get a little more, but everyone gets something. Same with school, school building aid. I wanted a $65 million school building aid because we had $65 million surplus in our education trust fund. I've been to a lot of schools. The roofs are leaking. I've been to a school where the windows and a couple classrooms were painted shut. I don't think that's up to code. I mean, I don't know how that's even possible. But they need 50,000, 80,000, 120,000 to do some of these projects. There's a school where the back door wouldn't shut all the way. My God, the security issues there. And they had, for two years, the town wouldn't allocate money for them to fix the door. We're sending the cash back so the property taxpayers don't have to do it. And, and again, I wanted school building aid so some of the bigger projects could get done. They wanted to make sure every town got a check. That's fine. So every town's getting a check for school building aid, for infrastructure projects. And then they wanted to make sure some of the base adequacy, the base funding, the dollars per child. You know, under my, under, in 2017, 2018, we spent more dollar per, dollars per child in public education than any governor in history. And now we're really amping it up. I mean, we're, we're, they wanted to push that even deeper. I said, fine. We found a compromise. I showed them how to do it without the taxes, without the tax increase that they were demanding. We just showed them how to be innovative with the math. That was my job as chief executive. And we got it done, and there's the compromise. Everyone got a little bit of what they needed. Everyone gave, had to give up a little bit of what they wanted. I didn't love the way they spent every dollar. You know, they took, I had money in Plymouth State. I had $9 million going to Keene State to build this new enterprise center that Keene State wanted. Every rep from Keene voted against it. What are you, nuts? <laughs> right? We have the money. It's surplus funds. Make the investment. They said no. Now, I fought hard and I got the UNH money back in. That's to double the number of nurses in our university system. I'm a big believer in nurses and healthcare workforce. I got 3,000 nurses over the next 10 years we need in this state. So we, gotta create, we can create our own engine to do that. 
So we, I convinced them to put that money back in. I couldn't get Keen's money back in. It still boggles my mind that they took that out, but anyway. So I, didn't, I couldn't get everything I wanted. I had to give up a little bit. We had a debt reduc student debt reduction program, $16 million a year. Guess what it would have cost taxpayers? Zero. They cut that out too. I got them to at least agree that we'd work together to try to get that back done again, right? Because it was all this extra money in the endowment. The endowments of the university systems are getting too much money. It's way above and beyond anything we ever expected. So he said, let's take the extra and turn it into debt payment programs. So we can incentivize, we, help pay, we know we have high student debt, right? So let's help pay down the debt and incentivize them to stay in New Hampshire. And it will cost taxpayers nothing. No, they didn't like that. The university stood up and said, no, don't take our endowment money. But look, what is endowment money doing? How about we invest in students? Well, there's a novel idea, right? So look, I didn't get everything I wanted, neither did they, but we got it done. And that's, I think that's the real take home here. In New Hampshire, we get it done. It can be tough. You have to battle things out. Sometimes you have to ask for a couple of years before you get on the agenda, whatever it is. Not just at the state level, but at the local level. But we are getting it done, and we're setting ourselves apart. This is not Washington. Washington's a mess. Washington is a bad place with bad people that do nothing. They don't. I go down there once every six weeks. I can't get out of there fast enough, really. I don't know what they do. Fire them all, for God's sakes, really. I mean, really, what do they do? Who, can, who out of Washington, I don't care what party you're from, who out of Washington can come back and say, look at my record of success, the leadership I've brought, what I've done. Are you kidding me? None of them. They're all failures, really. So I want us to be the model. We are being a model of success. I have governors all across the country calling me. Governor, how, you do, how do you do it without a sales or an income tax? Let me show you, right? Let me show you how we do it. So my general argument back to the other side in, in this time, when there's a lot of extreme legislation coming, why would I go and copy the model of other states of failure that are calling me to ask how our model works so well. Why would I pick up an income tax? My God, what a horrible idea. And I don't care whether the income tax is a dollar or 20%, it's a terrible idea. Because as with any tax, you crack the door this much, give it five years, it's wide open. And then we're just like everybody else. We're not like everybody else. We are different. We do it a little different, we do it a lot better. And that's something to take pride in. So it isn't just traditionalism. Look at the record of success. It doesn't mean everything's working perfectly, but it's working, and it's working really well. Not because the governor says so, not because the legislature says so, because as individuals, we empower those individuals. Government is not here to promise and guarantee much, but opportunity. That's my job. Not to create a system that just takes care of all your problems magically. That's, that's fantasy. That's what you hear other politicians talking about. It's about setting up doors of opportunity for you and your business and your kids and your school, whatever. As many doors as possible. How you go through that door? Live for or die. It's up to you. You want to take do door A, B, or C? That is completely up to you. I'm not going to mandate that your, that your round peg has to fit into our square hole. That's the old way government thought. You need to fit into our system. This is the way the government runs. You need something. Come work with our system. No, no, no. This is the 21st century, this is New Hampshire. Our job is to figure out what do you need and how do I challenge myself to change the system to work in your dynamics? Because those dynamics are ch always changing. Opioids, mental health, ec economy, whatever they are. So the government has to be flexible and has to be responsive. And you do it with a smile. You don't do it with anger and all the hatred and vitriol and negativity and toxic garbage you see out there, right? I don't have cable TV, I don't. If MUR, I don't know if MUR is here. I have the MUR app. That's how I get a lot of my news. But I, I won't have cable TV in my house. It's so ugly. Who watches that garbage? Right? We've somehow gotten into a place in society where we think we can treat each other so terribly as long as we're not looking you in the eye. As long as I'm just yelling at you on Facebook and saying mean, nasty things about you. It's on Facebook. It's okay. What a terrible way to be. And that's not just politics. That's, that's life. I got kids. My son's a freshman this year. My daughter's in eighth grade. I have a first grader. I'm a dad, and I'm scared to death. I really am. Not that because I think I need to make government take care of all their problems. That's not the way the world works, nor should it. But I'm scared to death about the bullying and the drugs and the vaping and all this stuff that we see out there. These are real issues, ex exponential to anything we ever saw before. 
So we've got to be willing to change the system. Things are so different now. Why should the government say, stay, well, we're going to stay the same? That's it. That's the philosophy. Some people like it, some people don't. Whatever. Hey, if you don't like it, that, that's what election day is for. I mean, really. But I, I, I beg of people, don't just say, I'm not out there saying, you must vote for Republicans. You must. No, vote for yourself. Be selfish with your vote. Really, be selfish with your vote. You can be. Invest in candidates, invest in elected officials, invest in the folks from the school board to the planning board to governor to president, whatever, that are truly doing actions that, that are getting somewhere down the road. That's what's important. And we have a system with every two years, I go back to that. The largest state government in the country? I mean, think about that. We have 400 representatives, more than any other state, and they only represent 1.35 million people. By definition, it is the most representative body of government in the world. That means you have all the power, all of it. You have all the say, and it's here in New Hampshire. Don't change it. The system really works. You don't get everything you want, but it really does work. I've gone on on a tangent. I'm no, sorry. It, uh, great concern. So a couple things. I mean, in, I'll go back to like 2011. I wasn't around then, but around 2011, there was a, uh, 20, 2009 actually in that budget, massive downshifting of cost to the municipalities because the state started pulling back on their, what they had traditionally been their obligation and paying a lot of the, the municipal costs for retirement benefits for a lot of the municipal, municipal employees. Um, in 2017, again, we sent 36 million to every city and town. I mean, what we're doing here is, uh, other administrations downshifted cost. I downshift cash, <laughs> right? That's what it is. And as long as we keep focusing on the economy and, and we, we're smart with our revenue projections, we can have surpluses and keep pushing the cash down. Now, on the regulatory side, uh, look, you're absolutely right. DOT, DES, environmental services and, and transportation, um, H, health and human services to a certain extent, uh, tough regulatory structures, and we're trying to streamline them as much as possible. One of the things I encourage you, whether it's through Councilor Crines or your representatives or just getting my cell number after this, give us the, I love the specific examples. So when things come up, just that's the benefit you have that the guy in New York, in your position, does not have. He'll, he'll, he'll probably never even meet his state senator or his representative. They don't even have an executive counselor, right? So use that. Like, call us. Some people say, well, I didn't want to call you, Governor. It really wasn't that big of a, an, it, you know, it was a big deal for us, but probably wasn't on your radar. Well, put it on my radar. That's the job, right? I, I take a little bit of when I was at Waterville Valley running a ski resort. My job was to make sure that the lifts turned, right, and the snow was cold but not too cold, and the cheeseburgers were warm, and customer service. It's all about customer service, treating you as an individual, not, again, asking you to, we're just going to float up here in a big government system. I hope you guys do okay. No. You've got to treat people as individuals from, from a customer service standpoint. So by all means, if there are specific examples, let us know. Have, I, I work with the commissioners on both those groups every day. They want to help. They're, they want to get very into the granular. I have no problem doing that. Um, but again, while times are good, and times are very good right now, we're just going to keep downshifting the cash, to be sure. So thank you, though. Let me just give you, I, I, there's a bunch of things, but let me give you three, three quick things. Let me give you my frustration first. In my first budget in 2017, we added another, I think, a 5% increase to in-home care. So to, to help start the pathway, the precedent, so that we, so we could start paying the in-home care nurses more money. Because when you let people be in-home, it's cheaper, it's better quality of life, everything works. You know where that money went? Administration costs. The groups ate it up in administration costs, and they, you saw almost no benefit to the actual nurses themselves. I can't tell you how frustrated that was. Now, in this budget, we said, okay, we're going to go across the board, and the Senate particularly wanted a 3.1% compounded over both biennium, 3.1 plus another 3.1% increase in rates that the nurses will now partake in, because a lot of them are on Medicare or Medicaid, right? We got that done. I had to find the innovative way to do it with no tax increase. We did it. So now we're going to give the biggest increase to that constituency. I, I cannot mandate it. They wouldn't let me do this. But I cannot tell you, it better go to the nurses. It really has to do that. I heard all these excuses why my original attempt, you know, well, a transportation costs and this. I get that. But you, I wanted it for nurses. That's what you asked for. And then the, administra the administrations of a lot of those groups took that money. I got more than a little upset at that one. So again, we're doing it again. The second thing is, we're going to double the number of nurses we have within UNH, just to start. And you add, I, I, last year we tripled, or tripled the amount of what we call SLURP, Student Loan Repayment Program, within Health and Human Services, and that is money 
to go to debt pay down. And, and that's, that was tripled from like 400,000 to like or just over maybe one and a half million, something like that. I'm, I'm roughing the numbers there a little bit. So we're actually paying these students, it's like cash in their hand to help pay down their student debt and incentivizing them to stay. So that's more cash, if you will. And now I'm gonna go back and I'll get into a, this $16 million program, which was essentially, again, solely for student debt reduction, that would have gone across the board in many different areas, but particularly with healthcare workforce, because that's where the focus has been, costs you nothing, and they said no. Every single one of you that wants more students, that wants more nurses, that wants more health care, you got to pick up the phone and say, why did you vote that out? It would have cost us nothing. Sixteen million a year. That's transformative. So you'll forgive me if when the other side says, you're not focusing on student debt, I've, done, I've tried to do more than any governor in history on it, and they said no. So again, hold folks accountable. Right? Hold folks accountable to their actions, not what they say, but what they actually do. The last thing is, as I won't bother you with the full story, but uh, I created something called the Governor Scholarship a couple years ago. And again, this was to incentivize students to take the path they wanted, not just a scholarship for the university system, but where the money doesn't go to the institution, it goes to the individual. And one of the groups that partook was the Red Cross. I loved it. So I could help pay with a scholarship these young students, or even older students if they wanted to, to go to the Red Cross, because you can start getting your LNA through the Red Cross. It's a really cool program. And I went over there and I met with some of the first graduates. And there was a young woman there, and she was a single mom, 20-something. I think she was 20-something. She's a single mom, and she said, look, one of the problems I have is I want to slowly work up to become an RN. But I, I can't go to school full time. I'm a single mom, my kids, but I could go part time but I want an LPN. Do you know how many pro LPN programs we had in this state at the time? Zero at the time. Zero. I said, what do you mean we have zero? She goes, I'd have to go to Fitchburg State or something like that. And I gotta be honest, I should have named the program after that young woman. Because of that story, I went to the community college, I said, LPN programs are coming back. For certain reasons, I know a lot of the hospitals didn't want that to happen, I won't get into that. But LPN programs are back in this state. Because that young woman stood up, told me a story, and we made it happen. Because we need to create a pathway. It's not about the program. It's not about the institution. It's about that young woman being able to design a career path for herself. Not the way the government said it should be done, but the way it's going to work for her and her family. We've had great success here. I know there's probably 10 more things we could be doing. Get my cell phone. Let us know. I can't make everything happen immediately, but these are the little details you gotta get involved in, and you gotta let people tell those stories, and we're having some real success here. There's more we can do, to be sure, but I, I'm a big believer, grow your workforce out of the university system or the community college, career academies. Do you guys know about career academies? Let me, let me tell you about career academies. I'm gonna brag about this one a little bit. Leave it to a Republican governor to find out how to give kids free college, right? We got innovative with it. We didn't say we're just going to pay for college. By the way, free college is the worst idea in the world. Because as soon as it's free and the government pays for it, you might as well call it the, the, the University of Washington, DC. And then, I mean, it would be a disaster. Because Washington doesn't run anything very well except for the military. But we came up with an idea and we said, you know, it costs about $15,000 on average to send a student to their senior year in high school. It costs about $7,500 on average for a year of community college. Hmm, let's set up a charter, a charter school. We're gonna embed it in the community college, and if a student wants, they can take their senior year, do dual and concurrent enrollment within the community college, 75, 75, we're taking that 15,000, we're just splitting it apart, so it's no cost to the student, no cost to the taxpayer of the system, and when they graduate, they get their high school diploma, an associate's degree, a certificate, and a lot of them are nursing programs, and the benefit is we've now connected hospitals and providers into this program. You're guaranteed a job interview. Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. It's not the end all be all, but for some students, that's a great pathway to get them. We're not waiting till you graduate at 22 to say, what do you want to do with your life? We're seeing at 14, 15, 16, how do I design a pathway for you on what you want to do that's going to connect directly into our workforce? We can do it with, with education, we can do it with technology, we can do it with manufacturing, and we are and we're creating these career academies all across the state, dual and concurrent enrollment. They love it, it's working, right? It's really, it's, it's very, very exciting stuff. Um, so anyways, those are the types of things. They're, they're in, I'm just gonna, I hate overusing the word innovative, but 
That was an idea that Frank Adelblut, the commissioner of education, came up with. And he said, what do you think? And we worked out some of the kinks. We brought in the, com the, the community college. We brought in the superintendents. They said, this is going to work. And, and then we're off and running. So again, you just bring everybody into the room and say, how do we do it different? How do we do it better? So there's a long way we can go, but I, I, just, I, want, I know you asked a specific question about in-home nursing, but I want folks to understand there's so much we can do with some of this innovation, not because we just come up with the I kind of came up with that one a little bit, me and Frank, but, but really, it really starts from the individual. And it starts from a mom saying, I need a better path for my kid, or it starts with someone in a business saying, we, no, we need to be able to, to afford you know, students to live here or, or to be able to pay them a living wage. Where, where are you located? I'm sorry, really quick. New London. New London. Yeah, I don't know where L New London is on some of the like workforce housing stuff. I mean, every town is so different. Yeah, you got it. You got to work them. Uh, here's here's the plan. Go to New London and find the five biggest taxpayers, the five biggest businesses in New London. I mean, I, I mean it. And bring them together and walk into the planning and zoning board and the selectmen and say, now what are we going to do? Because these businesses aren't going to hang around town very long if you're not driving on the workforce housing piece as well. So uh, great, great question. It's really about DOT. A um, couple, a couple of the issues we're trying to work through with DOT. Number one, if you're if you're a business and you're trying to get a curb cut, something as simple as a curb cut just to get your business done, it can be torturous sometimes. And one of the challenges I really have is we try to provide some flexibility in the system. The problem, which is good, I'm a very big believer, but the district engineers, the guy, the engineer in district one might have a totally different philosophy than the engineer in district five. Right? And if you try to, you're building something there, and then you just try to, you're a business, you're just trying to do the right thing, you follow the same rules over here in COAS, oh no, 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 we have a whole different standard over here, oh my goodness. And you gotta pay lawyers and all that, it gets crazy. So we, again, it's that balance of flexibility, but also giving businesses, um, they, so they can project, right? Giving businesses some assurance and some certainty about what the process is. My dad, taught, my dad, you know, he was governor. He doesn't give me a whole lot of advice. He really doesn't. We do not talk politics in our house very often. But he, he said one thing very early on in my life. Him and my mom were very strict about the rules. The rules are set. Everyone's got to follow the rules. You can't create rules that benefit these folks over here because they're your friends and, and not benefit these guys over here. Or you can't get, set, get rules that might penalize that group, but you're not going to, you're going to ignore those guys. Everyone's got to play by the same rules. You can have some flexibility, but uh, there's got to be a baseline of fairness in there. And that's where DOT gets off a little bit. So we're constantly trying to bring in those district engineers to kind of pre-plan a lot of that stuff. In terms of the funding of DOT, I don't mean to get too wonky, but let me tell you, first off, New Hampshire, excuse the term, gets screwed by Washington. We, we get less money for our roads than Vermont, like drastically less. And they have a fraction of our roads and a fraction of the population. It was this big political game, and God bless Bernie Sanders and, and the other senator over there, they had all these baseline projects. They jacked up special interest money into their state, created a baseline that went on into kind of perpetuity, and we get less than pretty much everybody else in the country on a, like on a per capita basis. It's very unfair. So we're always trying to find ways to supplement, which is why we probably shim too much, you know, cold patch and shim probably more than we should, and we're not actually doing enough of the roads um, because we, we just get shortchanged on that money. Now there's always a little extra money and I work with um, Secretary Chow very closely. She's become a very good friend, constantly trying to bring more dollars in, more flexibility in out of Washington because she knows we, we kind of, us in Texas of all places actually get a bit shortchanged. They're big, but for their size, they, they get shortchanged as well. So we try to actually go down and build relationships to get a little more preferential treatment from the federal government. That's fundamentally how most roads across the country are built. And that's why infrastructure money is so critical, right? We have a, we have a red list bridge issue. When I had 20 million extra dollars last year, I said it's going to red listed bridges. Like we're gonna start putting a chunk into red listed bridges, because God forbid, I mean, I think if we do anything, we gotta make sure you're not gonna, you know, we see what can happen. So you gotta get the baseline stuff first. So I think to your point is, it's regulatory stability and some certainty there. You know, while allowing a little flexibility, but some certainty for the individual, and then hopefully getting more, more dollars actually into it. I know Councilor Crines works on that very closely, given uh, the uh, tenure highway plan, which the council really has uh, oversees, and they do a very good job. They're always trying to, you know, we'd love to do every project in the world, but it's mostly based on how much money um, we're going we're gonna to get in the door. I see I'm getting a little bit of the high sign here. So, look, I really thank you guys. I appreciate everybody coming out. We want to be an open door. We want to be transparent. Doesn't mean everything we do is going to be great, but it's about a conversation and making sure that some of those stories I told, those individuals that stood up and told the story, sometimes they can be hugely transformative, right? You guys are on the front lines of these issues. You guys have the ideas. Let us know how we can keep doing it better. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.